right, so welcome back everyone to Filker Theory and Analytics. We're lucky today to have a guest speaker, um, Joel Freed, coming uh, to talk to us about Poker Tracker. Um, as you know, we have a great partnership going with Poker Tracker in this class. Um, they sent along Joel Freed to teach us analytics. Joel is a, um, a VIP support director for Max Value Software, who is the parent company of Poker Tracker. He has taught analytical techniques to some of the biggest names in the poker industry, and he's come by to uh, teach us that sort of thing also. So with that, I'm going to pass it along to Joel. All right, thanks. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to install Poker Tracker by now. Um, poker Tracker is the industry leading analysis and tracking software for online poker players. Um, we've been around since 2001, so we've been able to grow as the poker economy has grown. It started out as software for only for people who played Limit Hold'em, and it has exploded. We do Omaha now, uh, obviously No Limit and Pot Limit Hold'em, um, and we have extensive tournament support, some of which we'll be talking about today. Uh, what Poker Tracker does is it can help you identify and analyze similar decision points uh, to help you improve your game. So Poker Tracker is not going to do it all for you, but it's going to help you find the spots where you can improve and make better decisions. Um, so what do I mean when I say decision point? A decision point uh, is any time in a hand where you can make some action. So you can check, uh, you can bet, you can call, you can raise, or you can fold. At any point in a hand where you can do that, I'm going to call that a decision point. Um, and when you play poker, after you've played for a while, or if you've already played for a while, you'll realize you naturally remember similar decision points. Uh, if you're the short stack in a tournament and it's folded to you in the small blind, you're going to be able to lump all of those kinds of decisions together so that when you face that decision uh, the next time around, you already have some kind of history to build on. And using Poker Tracker to analyze the interesting decision points is really a very effective way to improve your game because the next time you come to a similar decision, you will already have some memory of what you believed to be right last time you were doing something like this. So what makes a decision point interesting? Um, it's interesting when you aren't sure what the right answer is. And that may seem kind of obvious, but when the expectation of the outcomes is really close together, you're going to sit at the table and you're going to agonize over it. And that's where you see people on television, where they're sitting there for minutes and they're going, ah, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, and those are the interesting decision points. And as you start out, you will find that you really don't know what you're doing a lot. Um, all decision points are going to be interesting until you start to have some kind of heuristic, some kind of rubric for when to call, when to fold. So here uh, is a situation. We are in the big blind. Uh, it's 100, 200 blinds. This is a tournament. Um, in this tournament, uh, it, it was a single table tournament. Uh, let's say you bought in for $10. $50 goes to first place. $30 goes to second place. And $20 goes to third place. So there's four players left here. You have a chip stack of 1,430 chips. And the uh, cutoff here, this player, opened all in for 5,700 chips. The player on the button folded, and this player called for 2,980 chips. So these two guys are already all in. You have ace-queen of clubs, so you're ace-queen suited, uh, and you have 1,430 chips back in this spot. I want you to take a second, and I want you to think about this decision, whether in this spot, knowing nothing about these two players, you know, you, you don't really know too much about them right now. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But without knowing anything really about these guys, they're just your average players in the game. Um, would you be calling or folding? I want you to think about that for a second. So I'll point out another feature here. Um, for those of you who are familiar with pot odds, your odds here are 3.35 to 1 to call. Um, if this was a cash game, if you had 23% equity against both of those hands, you could call profitably. Um, obviously, this is a tournament situation which affects things drastically right here. But yeah, so the total pot size is 4,810. We have 1,430 to call. So if you believe that this is a very easy decision, raise your hand. One, two, All right, we've got a few. Awesome. Okay, you guys are right. If you think it's a call, I want you to raise your hand. One call. For the people who think it's close, if you think it's a call, raise your hand. One, two, got a few. It's not even close, it is fold. Um, this is, so let me t talk a little bit about, about what's going on in this view. 
Um, this is uh, from our ICM quiz. Uh, Poker Tracker has a, uh, a feature that lets you practice in these end of tournament situations, um, which you can access through the tools menu bar, tools ICM quiz. Um, and in this spot, what it's telling you is if you push based on an average player model for these two players, uh, your equity in the tournament is 9.49%. Based on the, the, the uh, expectation of this hand against these two players when they're all in for average opponents. Uh, that means that you could expect to make $9.49 with the prize pool we've, we've picked out. Uh, if you fold, however, you have an expectation of 18.67%. And the reason for this is that it's reasonably likely uh, that the player with 2,980 chips is going to go out. And once you do that, you are guaranteed third place. So this is a clear fold. Uh, it's even, in fact, a clear fold if you have kings. Um, and you can go further in the Poker Tracker ICM tool. Uh, if you click the results link that's right here, um, it will bring up the full math. And I'm not going to go through the ICM math right now for you. I know you're going to go through that later in the course. Um, but what you can do is you can change their ranges right here by clicking these buttons. Um, and so I've set them to 100% range. That means these players are playing any two cards. So if, even if you knew before the hand, they, they pushed all in blind. They didn't even look at their hand. So they could have any two cards, either one of them. It's still a fold because fold equity still is, eight, is close to 19%. And your push equity is, is 15%, even though you're going to win half of all hands against two random cards. So before we talk a little bit more about how to use Poker Tracker to analyze your game and see where you can improve. I wanted to talk a little bit about how you can use Poker Tracker and not get better at poker. Because there are some very, there's some great and interesting stuff in Poker Tracker that you can spend lots of time looking at that will not help you at all make a better decision. So, looking at graphs. People love looking at their results graphs. And here's a nice results graph. You know, you started off a hand one, you had a nice run here, you went steady for a little while, you, you won a, you had a few big hands around hand 183,000, uh, and then you end up about plus 860,000 euros. Um, now, since poker is a series of decision points, the question is, which decisions would you make differently based on this graph? And the answer is, absolutely none of them. Knowing that you did this well in this spot is not going to help you make better decisions in the future. It may allow you to buy a house in the Boston area, but it will not help you actually play better poker. Another way you, can, you will not get better at poker by using Poker Tracker is by looking at hands which we call walks. A walk is when you're in the big blind and everyone folds to you. You win the small blind, which is nice, but you didn't do anything. There, there's no way in which you could make a better play in that hand. Um, and I know a lot of heads up sit and go players uh, who play two player tournaments like to look at those kinds of spots and they want to know well, how much am I winning there and the answer is it doesn't matter because you can't change your play based on who folds to you. Another thing that people want to do with Poker Tracker that won't help them get better at poker is analyzing luck. Uh, we have several tools for luck in Poker Tracker. This graph is from the cash game side. Um, it, it's actually, a, you, you'll notice the normal curve. Um, and this, this is actually normalized. So what you're seeing here is each dot um, tells you how often you're hitting your draws uh, relative to expectation. So uh, this player is more than one standard deviation above the mean at flopping three of a kind with, when he holds a pocket pair, uh, which we call flopping a set. And that's fantastic. He's probably making lots of money when he has these pocket pairs because making a set is a very powerful hand. However, um, he's not going to be able to change the way he plays by knowing that he's been lucky in the past because he may or may not continue to be lucky in the future. Uh, I also have a friend who spent lots of time building lots of reports to see if he was getting dealt aces more regularly than average. And while it's great to be dealt aces more, more regularly than average, and you will make lots more money if you get dealt aces more regularly than average, knowing what happened last week will not help you <laughs> the next time you're sitting at the poker table. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say about um, Poker Tracker, and this, this is a, a little bit uh, trickier, uh, there are lots of statistics and lots of numbers in Poker Tracker. I think that we have easily over a thousand different statistics you can look at, especially when you consider um, combinations of position. And if you add stack size to that, it's, it's, it's in the thousands for sure. Um, and the problem is some are not relevant to the spot you're looking at, and some will lack a sufficient sample. So I'm going to use this hand to uh, illustrate both of those points. This is a cash game hand uh, from, from a real poker site from about four years ago. 
Uh, this player was on, the player hero here was on the button and was dealt ace of spades, 10 of hearts. So he had ace 10 off suit. Um, before the flop, villain 16 made a raise and hero called. The flop was two of spades, four of spades, three of diamonds. Villain 16 made a bet and hero made a call. I'm not gonna go into whether or not that was a good play. Um, there are reasons for it, there are reasons against it, but for the purposes of, of uh, this hand, it's important to know that that happened. On the turn, villain 16 also bet, and hero also called. And, and uh, the turn was the, t the 10 of diamonds, and the river was the ace of hearts. So now we have two pair, top two pair in fact, and villain 16 makes another bet. The bet was 1,550 British pounds, uh, and the, the pot was 1,975 pounds. So we're sitting here, we're getting 2.27 to 1 odds, um, which, so if we, if we call and we're ahead 31% of the time or more, it's a good call. Uh, we can fold. Uh, our stack is, is 3350, so we could, we could also make a raise um, to like 17, 1800. Now, we have lots of stats here on the table. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all. This is our heads up display, so we're looking right now at, a, at the, the Poker Tracker replayer. Um, the important ones to note for this, for this purpose is this red number here, this 97. This is the number of hands of data we have on this player. So if you were sitting at a casino, you get about 30 hands an hour. So this would be the equivalent of about three hours of live play against somebody. Online, it's more like an hour and a half because online hands tend to come a bit faster. So we've got, we've got some data. Um, it's not a huge, huge sample. Um, VP is the, the VPIP number that was talked about last time. Uh, that's the percentage of hands he's playing. Uh, so he's been playing about two out of three hands. So he's been in a lot of pots. So we, we know that about this guy. And PR is pre-flop raise. So that's how often he's coming in for a raise um, or raising at some point in the hand. And that's 45%. So two-thirds of the time, because 45 over 65 is, is two-thirds, um, roughly, he's coming, he, he is making raises. So he's aggressive and he's playing lots of hands. And here we're in this spot where we're facing a big bet on the river. Um, and here are his, so we've got his river stats. So if you click on, on the, the HUD, you're gonna get, you're gonna get this pop-up. There's, there's a bunch of tabs here, tools, pre-flop, flop, turn, river. Since this is a river spot, I've just got the river tab open. I didn't wanna overwhelm you guys yet. Um, and we can see his bet stats. So on the river, in our entire sample, he's had eight chances to bet the river. And he bet three of those chances. And I'm gonna tell you that that number is completely and totally irrelevant to this situation because we can also see this number for C-bet. Now, C-bet is, is a poker term. Uh, it's called a continuation bet. That means that a player has been aggressive the entire hand up till now. So a uh, C-bet on the flop, he was the last raiser pre-flop, he gets a chance to open the action on the flop and he does. That's a flop continuation bet. A turn continuation bet, he made a flop C-bet and he now has a chance to bet on the turn, he makes a turn bet. So that's a turn C-bet. A river C-bet is he makes a turn C-bet and now he has a chance to bet the river. And we have never, not once, seen him get a chance to make a river C bet. So if we tried to use this 38% here, and we said, well, he only bets 38% of the river, so he must have a really big hand here, we would be basing it on wrong information because it's, he could have gotten to the, to the river in any way for these bets to count. He could have been calling, a calling down in position, and then it was checked to him, and that, that, that would count. Uh, he could have been raising, he could have raised pre-flop, checked the flop, checked the turn, that would count, any combination. And his hand strength is going to be vastly different those times he has bet the entire way than those times where it's, he's done other things. So since we have a sample of zero C bets here, these river stats are not actually that useful for analyzing this spot. And you're much better off um, looking at the board and trying to figure out, based on his pre-flop numbers and his flop numbers, what kind of hand gets here. Um, I could talk about this hand a lot more, but that, that's kind of our, our, our point here. So now we've talked about ways that you can not get better at poker using Poker Tracker. So let, let's get to the interesting stuff. How do you get better at poker using Poker Tracker 4? And I'm going to say it's a five step process. Step one uh, use Poker Tracker 4's reports and filters to look at very specific kinds of decision points. Find those times you find interesting, find those times where you don't know the answer. And those are the ones we're going to look, you, sh you should be looking at because those are the ones that can help you get better at poker. The next thing to do is create mental models of the players in the specific situation. So that means you should have an idea what you think those players are doing here. 
Um, now, even though they're looking at similar kinds of decision points, you're not always going to have similar kinds of players in those hands. You might be facing, if you want to look at all times you were facing a river continuation bet, you're going to have sometimes you're against aggressive players and sometimes you're against passive players. You're going to have uh, times where the river made a draw come in. You're going to have times where the river paired the board. All of these are slightly different, not necessarily different enough. You wouldn't want to lump them together for point one. But enough that you need to, to definitely think about the players in this specific situation and try to get an idea, what's this player doing right here? And this is exactly what you would do at a live table when you're sitting across the table from somebody trying to figure out, well, what is going through his mind right now? Then you, you adjust that model that you have, you've just built uh, based on any relevant statistics that you do happen to have, if you have notes on the player or anything else. Um, if you know that this guy lost a big hand two hands ago, and he might be what's called in the poker world steaming, he is really mad, and he is just going to be way more aggressive right now, that's relevant information. Uh, if you're sitting in a casino and you've, you know that guy has just finished his fifth beer and he's slurring his words a little bit, that's relevant information. Anything that you can do to adjust the model that you've built to, to be more relevant, that's good. Uh, then you evaluate your different decision options. So. If you're in a spot where you can, you can, let's say you can just either call or fold, you have to think about what kind of hand does he have? What will I win if I make a call here? Um, what, if I fold, obviously I'm out of the hand. Uh, what, for tournaments, what chip stack will I have remaining? What, uh, how does this affect everyone else's standings in the tournament? There's a lot of considerations for tournaments um, that affect your, especially your preflop decisions. And then, once you've done all four of these things, go to step one and do it again. <laughs> Continue to do this over and over again every time you have an interesting kind of decision and you will find that you are able to make um, better decisions because you understand the different decision points that you're facing. So let's talk about how to navigate Poker Tracker 4 a little bit. Um, for those of you who have it installed and have your computer here, feel free to open up Poker Tracker um, and follow along with me. Um, so what I'm calling a report is any kind of way in which Poker Tracker is showing you data. Um, on the top left here, there's community, which launches our community page. Uh, you can look at um, our forums, you can download custom stats, all sorts of other fun stuff. Play Poker, this is where you go uh, when you want to actually play. So for those of you who haven't actually uh, done any importing in any of the, of the tournaments yet, uh, when you, you want to play, you go to Play Poker and you click the Get Hands While Playing button. Uh, and view stats here, this is where all of your information is going to be displayed. Uh, T is for tournament, which is going to be all you guys are interested in, and we have four options, results, statistics, my reports, and graphs. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about graphs today at all, uh, just because there, there really isn't enough time. Um, so there's this left-hand sidebar here, uh, and some people have, have liked closing it to make things bigger, and you should not forget that it is there. A lot of the navigation options are in that sidebar, and there is a huge amount of value in, in being able to change reports. So right now we're looking at the overview report. Uh, it's got a nice graph. You can change different kinds of graphs. You can show your ROI, your ITM, your in, ROI is return on investment. ITM is in the money percentage. You can show those on this graph too. You can see you know, your results, how much you've won, how many tournaments you've played. Um, and down here, this, so this is a report. Right now we're looking at the basic by description report, uh, which is showing you one row per description of tournament type. Uh, for you guys, honestly, just looking at by tournament is probably going to be okay. That will give you one row per individual tournament. You're not going to have so much data that it's going to be hard uh, to group things together, and most of your tournaments are relatively similar. Um, if you choose advanced rather than basic, all it does is give you more stats. Uh, you, so you might want to spend some time you know, looking at what these numbers mean in basic before you flip to advanced. Um, and it's also important to know, so you can change any report here for, from this drop down, and I'll talk about what the different ones are in a little bit. Um, but the overview report has one really cool feature that is not obvious, and that's you can double click to get more details. So if you want to know more about these 392 tournaments, because if those are the ones you're, you're, you're going to start playing tomorrow, and those are the ones that are really interesting, then you double click, and now you see each one of those 392 tournaments, one tournament per row. Uh, and you get to see you know, how much you won in that tournament, how long it was, your finish position, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And it does say here on the side, double click a row for more details. And you can go back by choosing back by description or choosing remove all filters and return to root. Now, if that's not enough, uh, you can then double click the individual tournament and it will show you the hands, one hand at a time. 
So you're going to get a row for each hand as the, as the tournament went through. It will show you most recent 100 by default. If the tournament ran more than 100, you can, you can feel free to change that. Um, we just have that set so that it doesn't choke too, you know, too hard if you have like a 1500 hand tournament or something. Um, you can also sort uh, by clicking any of the column headers just like you know, any other um, reporting software. So you've got one row, one row per line here. You can also right click, uh, which has a lot of useful features. Uh, it has, so it's a context menu, um, and you can use that to add or remove statistics from your report. So when you get into the, um, the, like your VPIP and your PFR and those kinds of things, you might want to add or remove a bunch of different custom stats. So you can do that with configure report here. Uh, but you can also replay, this is how you'd replay hands. Uh, if you want to export videos and put them on YouTube directly, uh, you can just right click, choose export video, put it on YouTube, post YouTube video on Facebook, and everyone can see your awesome play, which is always fun. Um, and if you want to look at, multiple, at multiples at a time, you can use control and shift click. Um, so control click will highlight one extra individual and shift click will highlight a range. So you'd like, if you click here, you hold shift, you click here, it'll highlight everything in between. And then you could say replay hand. You could also say replay all hands and report, and it will load everything up in the replayer. Uh, this would be the way, if you wanted to replay an entire tournament, you know, you had such a great tournament, you really want to watch it again right now, um, you can just replay all hands and report, and presto, you know, it, you can just click play and sit back, and your whole tournament will play through. Uh, so another report in this, on the statistics side that, that I wanted to highlight for you is, is summary. And the reason summary is interesting and useful is that summary allows you to do different kinds of grouping. Uh, in particular for you, I think starting hands hold them, as shown here on the right, and position will be your most useful ones. Um, so what happens in starting hand hold them here, you have one row per hand type. So you can see here we had aces 131 times. This is how many big blinds we won, um, adjusted for, for, luck, uh, for uh, all in equity. Uh, the VPIP is 100%. Congratulations. If you did not know it, you will almost certainly voluntarily put money in the pot 100% of the time when you get dealt aces. If this number is not 100% of the time, I recommend going back and rethinking your decision process because aces is the best hand in Texas Hold'em for certain, and nobody will say anything else about that. Um, and, but you can, see one, you can see different rows for all the different hand types. And uh, that is going to be the best way to see, like, you know, if you feel like, you know, I'm playing some of these suited connectors a little, maybe, maybe it's too much, maybe I'm not sure. Uh, am I playing jack-10 suited too much? Am I playing um, king-queen offsuit too much? If you're not sure, come here and you can start looking at the hands. Because whatever row you have here, the hands from that row will display in the bottom. And it works just like the other hand report. You can, you can replay them. You can double click for more information on one. Um, you know, they're all right here. Uh, and position groups, I don't have an a, a image of it, but it groups one row for position. And when I say position, I mean if you're in the big blind, if you're in the small blind, if you're on the button. Um, so if you feel like someone is beating up on my big blind, man, I sit there and every time he ra I get my blinds raised and I have to fold and I hate it, um, you know, can I play back? Or am I doing it right and it just feels wrong to me? Because sometimes your memory of the situation isn't really the truth. Uh, you can come in and, and load up the position report, and you'll be able to see exactly what's happening. Another really awesome report um, is the Hold'em Hand Range Visualizer. This is in statistics as well. Uh, and it, it, it looks like a lot, but it's not actually as crazy as it looks. So first off, over here we have various different statistics. So when you, when you choose a statistic, you're getting information based on your uh, values in this spot. So let me talk about what, what three betting is. Uh, three betting means someone has made a first raise, that's the, that's the two bet, and then you made the second raise, and we're talking about pre-flop only right now, so you made the three bet. So someone raised, and you re-raised. That's, that's all we know about these hands right now. But we're looking at only, only those spots right now in this report, and, and you can look at all kinds of different spots, and this little wrench here lets you configure, and if you want to put different stats here, you can do that too. Um, so right now we're looking at range, so here it says range and value. So when I say range, I mean, these are the hands that you have actually done this with. And the percentages, the, these, are, these numbers here are percentages. And each one tells you what percentage of all of the hands that I have made a three bet with does this comprise. So let's look at pocket tens. This player made a, made a re-raise with pocket tens. Of hands, he made a re-raise. 2.24% of those, he had pocket tens. If, so you can think about this as, you know, if I made this re-raise and someone else was against me, you know, what, what could they expect to see? Well, for, about almost 4% of the time they'd expect to see ace-queen offsuit. 
a 4.28% of the time, they'd expect to see ace-king. 2.5% of the time, aces. So this is what your actual range looks like. And in, in poker, we use range kind of as the term for, um, if you think of the domain as all, all whole cards, right? So you know, those are all, all whole cards you could be playing. Um, your heuristics, your mental processes at playing poker is the function that takes a, a hand from the domain and puts it in the range. So this is your range. Now you can change this from range to value. And this is where it gets cool. This is the percentage that you three, that the, this player made a three bet, given that he had a chance to with each of these hands. And so you're going to notice something very different right away. We have a whole lot of 100s here. This player has made a three bet 100% with ace king suited, ace queen suited, ace jack suited, ace 10, and ace nine suited. Every time he had those hands and he had a chance to make a re-raise, he did it every single time. But if you look at the actual percentages, they are not the same, 0 0.84, 0 0.93, 1.49. So you can tell also that he got dealt ace-jack suited in these kinds of spots a little bit more uh, because he's still doing it 100% of the time. So this report is fantastic for helping you figure out, first of all, what would an opponent be seeing uh, me do? You know, what am, I, what am I looking like? And then, well, what am I actually doing when I get my hands in these spots? If you think, you know what, I should never be making re-raises with King Jack off suit, and you come here and you go, well, I've been doing it 75% of the time, you immediately know something that you can use next time you have King Jack off suit in that situation to make a different play. That will let you change your poker. And again, you can pick any of our statistics from here, uh, and you can, you can look at them. Anything that shows percentage-wise will work in this report. Uh, another really important report for tournament play in particular is uh, facing preflop action. So again, we're in statistics section, uh, and it's the facing preflop action report. What you're seeing here is one row per kind of situation that you could be in on your very first action before the flop. You get dealt your cards, stuff happens before you, and now it's your first decision. Well, the question is, what happened until then? If it's an unopened pot, that means everybody folded to you. So it's, it's a similar kind of situation. So here we can see we have 10,434 hands where this player was, first, was the first to be able to open the pot. You can see the winning percentage. You can see their VPIP and PFR. So again, you know, they're playing almost, two, almost uh, a little more than 70% of hands in that spot, raising 60%, a little more. Um, but you can see one limper. Now a limper means someone just called the big blind. It's a technical term means there's one person who just called a big blind, uh, and it's to them. They have, we have 1,945 hands for that. And you can see how, how their VPIP changes. Suddenly, they're, they're not putting in nearly as much money. Uh, and part of the reason for this is this sample is based on um, heads up play. So when you check in the big blind, it's not considered voluntarily putting money in because you haven't put any more money in. And you can only VPIP before the flop. After the flop is a totally different animal. So VPIP is pre-flop only. Uh, and and that, that's a good thing to keep in mind. So that's why you see this, this kind of big drop. Um, but you can already see how, looking at this report, I can tell you something about this player's play. They check a lot when it's limped to them, and they're in the big blind, and it's heads-up play. So you can use these, and of course this works like the other reports. Uh, all of your hands are down here. Um, and so you can, you can replay these hands, you can, you can do other filtering in addition to this, um, and it will help you kind of figure out what your play is in, in different first situation spots. And uh, tournament play, this is going to be huge because when you're facing an all-in before you get a chance to act, your range is going to be very different. You're going to want to make different decisions um, than you will if everyone folds to you uh, because you're able to steal the blinds a lot more liberally. Um, and you're going to see later in the course uh, how, how aggressive you can actually be as your chip stack gets small. So being able to look at these different kinds of spots will help you fine-tune your game and, and you know, look at what you've actually been doing in those situations. So, uh, I've mentioned lots of reports. Do you need more than that? I'm glad you do. Because you can create custom reports in the My Reports section. Uh, in here, you can choose the type of report, how to group the report, and how to show exactly what you want to see. So any of our stats can be added to these reports. There's three kinds. A player report um, starts out by looking at hands that you've played. You're looking at groups of hands, so a stat like VPIP. Uh, looks at groups of hands, because it's a uh, how often you voluntarily put money in the pot over a sample of hands. That's to contrast with a hand report, uh, which is going to show you, again, one row per hand. So if you wanted to like uh, make a report that was going to show you all hands where you faced a river continuation bet, 
you could do that as a hand report and save it and load that up really quickly next time. An all players report is like a player report, except it's not just for you, it's for everybody in your database. So you're going to get one row per player, uh, and you can put whatever stats you want on it there. For player report, we also have lots of different groupings, some of which you will not see anywhere else by default in Poker Tracker. And I wanted to specifically highlight preflop stack size for you guys, because as tournament players, this kind of custom report has a lot of value for you. Um, because preflop stack size is going to be the determining factor in a lot of situations in your tournament play. So let's see what that report looks like. Um, you get one row per different stack size, you get different ranges. Now, these are in big blinds, I, they're not in M. Um, but you get, you get a pretty nice, nice range, and you can, you can kind of approximate M um, by multiplying that uh, by two-thirds, um, because you're going to be dividing it by the, the, big bl the small blind, too. Uh, so you can see here, this player had the stack less than two big blinds 59 times, and this is how often they raised when it was folded to them, and you can see it's 47%. So you can see, at, you know, in, this, in this spot, how someone's raising range is going to change based on their stack size, uh, and, and you can see we have, we have different samples for all the different stack sizes. Uh, based on the tournaments you guys are actually playing, uh, you're going to be seeing numbers you know, much more in, in this area and a lot less in this area because you need to be really, really deep to be able to have 100 big blinds. And, and in turbo tournaments, it just really doesn't happen that much. But in addition to be able to just look at this, you can then come in here to this blue filters link. Well, it, it will be blue for you until you've clicked it once. It's gray for me here. Um, and then you can make individual filters, and you can save that with this report. So you could come in here, and you could take this report and filter for times you're facing an all-in. And you would then see times you were facing an all-in by stack size and see what your stats are. And you could save that, and it would show up in this dropdown. And you could look at it later, and you wouldn't need to redo everything. And, and it would be, will be really helpful for uh, analyzing your own play. So I've talked a lot about filtering. How do you do that? This button here, More Filters, is the gateway to all of the filtering everywhere. And uh, other than the doing specific stuff for custom reports, this is the place where you're going to go if you want to see specific subsets of your data. So when you click it, you're going to get this window. And here's how you, so there are five sections over here, game details, hand details, hand values, board texture, and actions and opportunities. And each one of these has different kinds of filters. Um, and we, we tried to break it down as intuitively as possible. Um, so game details is all stuff for how to filter at the game level. You know, what, what day did I play it on? Um, what currency was it in? You know, uh, what was the speed? Was it a turbo? Was it a hyper turbo? Was it a super turbo? What was the buy-in? What was its description? Uh, what was the table size? You know, were there six players at a table, ten players at a table? Um, and you can also filter for the uh, specific blind levels. So if you wanted to look at a hand at the 100, 200 blind levels, uh, that would be there. Now, so you navigate this by, you choose your section on the left-hand side. Anytime you see this, the uh, greater than symbol, you can click. So any of these options here, you can click and you'll get like the individual filters you can turn on and off. And I'll show you a few of those later. When you go down, you can click up here where it says cancel right now. It will change to the, up, up to the previous section. And when you turn everything you want on, you click add to filters, and then it, it adds them all together. Uh, here, so here's hand details. Hand details is filters about uh, the whole hand as, all together. So what was the maximum preflop raise that occurred? You know, was there a three bet at all? If you want all hands where someone made a three bet, you'd come here, uh, which can be great um, if, if you want to look at times when you made a raise and someone made a re-raise, but you don't really care who. Uh, you just want to look at all three bet hands, you can come in here. If you want to look at hands where there was limping, you can, you can turn that on. If you want to look uh, at hands by the pot size or stack depth, so you want to look at hands where you had a certain M, you can come in there. How many players were at the table? If you want to look at bubble hands, you'd look there. Uh, what, was your, what was the position of different players? Who made the first raise? Where was I sitting? All of that's in player position. Um, you've got whether, you, th this is mostly for custom reports and notes. Uh, if you made tags on the hand, you can, you can tag hands in the right-click menu. You can do that there. How much you won or lost in the hand? How much you contributed to the pot? Did the hand go to showdown? There's, there's tons of options. Hand values um, is another way you're going to want to look at hands, and that is your whole cards, your hand strength, and your draw strength. So let's go through those. Uh, this is what the whole card filtering looks like. You've got the chart of all the different whole card options. Uh, so there are several ways you can do it. If you want, you can just click on individual whole cards. So if you just wanted to pick, uh, say, pocket tens, you click right there, add to filter, you're done. And now all, you only see data from pocket tens. If you wanted to see the top 15% of hands, you can come down to this slider and you can slide it over to 15%. Now, my top 15% of hands and your top 15% of hands may be different. That's why we have this model option. 
Um, so we're using by default this Glansky Carlson model, which was um, invented by them in response to a very specific math problem, which I think you guys will talk about later in the course. Um, so that we use that as, as the default model uh, to rank hands. But if you don't like that, you can actually go in and you can make your own custom model. You can say, you know what, I want 3-2 suited to be the best hand in the deck because I love it. You can do that. You can put that at the top. Um, we also have hand versus three randoms as a default model, uh, which ranks hands based on their equity against three random sets of whole cards. It's going to look very different. It's going to be a lot more skewed towards uh, high cards. So you're going to see things like king jack offsuit and queen jack offsuit long before you see low pocket pairs. So that's going to make things radically different uh, in terms of using the percentages. There's also this group select button, which will save you time if you're making like a, if you want to do like any ace, you can just click group select any ace. Or if you want to do any pair, group select any pair. If you want to invert it, you can just click group select and invert, and it will and anything that's turned on will be turned off. So you have lots of options there. And once you set whatever you want, you just click add to filter. Uh, hand strength. So once you see the flop, you have some hand strength. So all of these do imply having some sort of hand. Uh, you know, did you have a high card? That means you don't have any pair. You know, you just look at what your high card strength is. One pair, two pair, three of a kind, all the way down. There are multiple, multiple options in each of these. I'm just going to look at straight just to save a little bit of time. Um, so what you would pick is what street you made it on. So if you wanted to look at only times you made the straight on the river, you could pick that. You know, when, um, if you wanted to see any street, if you wanted to see all three streets, you can just change that and turn it on. Uh, how many whole cards you used. If you wanted both of your whole cards to be used to make this straight, you can turn that on right here. Uh, nut and non-nut strength straight uh, means it's the best possible straight versus a better straight could be made. So if you have ace-king and the board is queen-jack-10, you have the nut straight. No one can have a better straight. You have the absolute best straight. If you have 9-8 on that same board, you still have a straight. 8-9-10, jack-queen-king. Not jack-queen. But ace-king still is a better straight than you. So you would have the non-nut straight. Backdoor straight is when you don't have a straight on the, on, until the river, and you didn't have a straight draw on the flop either. So if you had ace-jack with a king on the board, and it came queen-10 to bust some opponent on the bubble, you just completed a backdoor straight and made somebody very unhappy. Draw strength. So th these, are, these are how you would look at, if you wanted to look at my straight, my straight draws, my flush draws. You'd pick which street you had it on, which can be any flop turn or both, because you never have draws on the river. Your hand is made or not. Um, and we have the different kinds of draw options. So for straight draws, you can have either a draw to, to one card, which makes you four outs, or a draw to two cards, which makes you eight outs. Um, and we let you pick here whether they're the, the outs to the best possible straight or outs to some straight that's not the best, um, depending on you know, whether it's open-ended or double gut shot. Uh, we also you can filter for backdoor straight draw or hands where you didn't have any straight draw ever. So you can imagine these can combine for lots of different things. Uh, board texture um, is how the cards are, are working together on the flop. Uh, if you wanted to look for a, a flop with any ace, you'd go into board cards and you could pick ace on the flop. If you wanted to look for the, the turn paired the board with the flop, you'd go into board pairing to the turn section, and that one's there. If you wanted to look for times the flop was all three clubs, so you, you want monotone, you would go into board suits and you'd pick all three cards of one suit for the flop. Uh, board connectedness is like 1098 is considered a connected flop. 1097 is a little less connected. So all of those kinds of options are in there. So you can be really specific about picking the situations you're filtering for. And now, actions and opportunities is the last section, um, but in some ways it's almost the biggest because these are actions you had or opportunities you had in hands you played. So um, this includes bets and sizing, raises, raises faced, raise sizing, f calls, folds, opportunities, you name it. So we're going to look at preflop just quickly so that you get an idea. Um, if you want to look at hands where you voluntarily put money in pot, turn that on, posted blinds, Raises, calls, folds, opportunities, all of these are here to let you um, filter for times you made a three bet, times you faced a three bet, times you folded to a three bet, uh, times you had a chance to face an all in, that would be an opportunities. Uh, action sequence is your specific action. So your first action is raising, your second action is call. Let's bring those up. Um, bet sizing, I want to look at times I made a three big blind open raise. We can bring those up. Actions and counter with sizes is what someone else did and it came to me. So they made an open raise of three big blinds and it came to me. That would be in there. And we have those for, for flop, turn, and river two. If that's not enough and you need more stuff, you can combine these. So you can highlight them. So this is what it looks like after you click add to filters. Uh, so we've added two. Size is calculated in big blinds. Actions faced two bet preflop between two and three. So that means that someone made a two to three big blind open before the flop and we faced that raise. Um, that, that, that's that filter. And this is we made a first raise preflop with between two and three big blinds. Now, it should be obvious, 
these will never happen together. So if you leave these on within and you click save and apply to all filters, you will see no data anywhere because that can never happen. So what you might want, however, is you want to see any of these two times. So you're looking for hands where someone made that two to three big blind open. I want to see how that affects things on the turn, let's say, because those are the spots I want to look at now. That's what the or selects. So you'd use or. This is inclusive or. Um, so any of the times that match either one of these two spots will come together. And when you click that, uh, they, it says or, and you get the two filters together. Um, and you can also click ungroup once things are grouped together, and you can split it back up. Uh, you can use and if you want to to make nested deeper logic, and not uh, will negate things. So if you wanted to look at, and if you wanted to negate, you know, facing a, you made times you made a two-bit of that size, you could just click on that one and click not. Uh, it's not highlighted here because you can't not two things at once. Uh, and, and you know, you would see all other time, all other situations. So, as you can imagine, making a complicated situation is going to take you some time, and it's going to take you a little work to get used to it. That's why we added this save as quick filter option. So once you've made it. You don't have to make it again, which is fantastic, because if you spend half an hour on one of these things, you don't want to click clear filters and never see it again. So you just click save as quick filter and type your quick filter name and click OK, and then you're done. It is now saved for the future. Uh, you will see it on a drop down, uh, which I'll show you in a couple of slides, and you will just be able to load that right up on any of your reports instantly. Uh, on the other side, we have this edit quick filters button, and when you click that, it shows any saved quick filters you have. When you click on it, it shows you what they are. You can rename them, delete them, uh, you can load them, which is awesome when you have multiples. If you want to put them together, you can load one and then come over here and load the other one, and you can append them together so you don't have to make, you can make like several pieces and then put them together really fast. Um, we, we also have them available for free download on our website, uh, and then you would import them right here. Uh, and if you wanted to export them and give them to your friends, you wanted to, you know, you said, let's, let's all make a group of filters together. We'll split up the sample. And you make these, you make these, I'll make these. And then you want to give them all to each other, great. You just export them, give them to each other. It saves you a whole bunch of time. And this is the drop down in the sidebar. Uh, so you see, like, once we've made this quick filter, you just pick it, click that, and you're done. Now that filter applies to all of the reports on the other side. So I've talked a lot about stats. And I hope you're sitting there wondering, what are these things? How can I find out more about them? Like, I want to know about it, but there's so much going on. So the way these work is the vast majority of stats in our software will tell you what percentage of the time somebody did something given that he had a chance to. So it's this very simple mathematical formula. How often did he do it? How often did he have a chance to do it? Turn it into a percentage. Done. How often did he have a chance to three bet? divided by how, how often did he actually 3-bet, divided by how often he had a chance to 3-bet, multiply it by 100. If it's 1% of the time when he 3-bets you, he has a hand. So let's go through a few examples. Uh, VPIP, we've already talked about a bunch. So it's the percentage of the time a player chose to put money in before the flop. Uh, this is considered like one of the staple stats uh, because it really speaks to how uh, much a player is involved in the pot. If you've been sitting at a casino and you see a guy that's just splashing money every hand, he's playing every hand, he doesn't care, his VPIP is very high. And it's, it's easier to think about that player when you start building models in your mind of what do players who have VPIPs do. And you can start to categorize players by like VPIP numbers. So someone who has a for, uh, VPIP of 40 is going to have similar kinds of play style to someone else who has a VPIP of 40, even if you don't know a whole lot else, because this one will con converge pretty quickly, since they will VPIP or not pretty much every hand. Race for a sin is a little bit more restrictive, um, but I think it's the one that's really useful for you guys in tournament play. It's the percentage of time a player raises on their first action when everyone has folded to them. So if everyone folds to you and you raise, you raised first in the pot. Uh, so if you see that be 40% for somebody, they are raising a ton. They are raising almost half of all hands. It's a huge number. Uh, if you see, and these can combine, these work together, right? So if someone has a VPIP of 70 and a, and a raise first in of two, they are calling all the time, but they are not raising ever. So this starts to give you an idea of what kind of player they are. They're the kind of player who just puts money in, but they are not willing to commit to a raise. They don't want to bring the stakes higher. They just want to go along with whatever's happening. And some stats can be super crazy specific. So we've already talked about what three bets are. We've already talked about what C bets are. There is a stat in our system called fold to raise after flop C bet in a three bet or higher pot. So that's what three bet plus means. Three bet or higher. So let's break this one down. It means that 
we made a three bet or higher before the flop. That is, we either three bet or we four bet or we five bet or we six bet, anything, anything higher. We, but we made the last raise because we made a C bet on the flop. So we made some last raise preflop that was a, at least a re-raise. And on the flop, we had a chance to bet. And we bet. And they raised us, because they raised. And we folded to that specific raise. You will not see this happen in your tournaments because you are going to be too short to really get these situations. In a cash game, this can be really useful once you have a few thousand hands on somebody. Um, but as you can imagine, we, if, this, if we have this, we have a lot of other really specific stats. So if you find something you want to know more about, you can go through our stat list and find if there's something there that already does it. Um, and this is one where you might not want to pay attention to it until you have a really good sample size on somebody. So how do you find all the stat list? If you click Configure from the menu bar and you choose Statistics, it's going to pop open this window, uh, which is going to show you our entire stat list. So you guys are going to want to change the tournament. And there are player stats and hand stats for the different kinds of reports. Uh, and you choose stats here. So we've got, we're looking at tournament player stats. Uh, you can see we have this list. We're just looking at the call stats here. Uh, you, can, you can see the scroll bar. So we have a lot. Uh, if you want to search for specific ones, you can just type. Like if you type 3-bet in here, you suddenly see only 3-bet stats. So we're looking at a stat called, called preflop squeeze. If you, were, if you were looking through the stats and you saw this and you said, well, what is that situation? Well, that situation is described here in details in the detailed description. A squeeze is when uh, someone has made a raise and someone else made a call. And then somebody three bets both of them. That projects an image of a lot of strength. Um, this is talked about in Harrington on Hold'em as a great way to make a move. Um, because if someone makes an open raise for three big blinds, someone else calls, and you're sitting there for 10 big blinds, and you shove all in, the first player needs to decide what's the, what's the, this, the guy behind me who called going to do. And what's this guy doing? He's got to have a big hand if he's able to shove all in over both of us. So that raise is called a squeeze. If you face a squeeze and you call it, it will count for this situation. Uh, if the, first, the player who made the first raise folds, you still face the squeeze if you called. So those are the two spots here. Uh, and you can see we have the detailed description that explains exactly what it was. And the formula gives you the, the, actual, um, raise, the actual number we use. We don't say multiply by 100 here just to keep it a little bit simpler. Uh, we have these detailed descriptions for every stat in the list. So if you are so inclined, you can spend several hours reading through our entire stat list. And I think you will probably be the first person who has ever actually done it besides me. So, all right, we've talked a lot about opponents and what opponent stats can be. How do you find them? How do I, how do I look at opponent stats in Poker Tracker? This is going to be important because you need to figure out what these numbers mean for your various opponents. So the first way is in the results. In the results section, we have a player summary report. And we saw it in that drop down earlier. When you choose this report, you're going to get one row per player. And I've blocked out the players' names for confidentiality reasons. Uh, but you can then see how many tournaments they played in, what their VPIP is, what their PFR is, what their 3-bet is, how often were their 3-bet successful. That is uh, how often they 3-bet and everyone folded to it, which is really fun because if you have a really high 3-bet success, that means you can really 3-bet with impunity because everyone's folding and it's great. Uh, you, pick up, you pick up the open raise, you pick up the blinds, you can make lots of money. So you can see this guy is good at picking spots. He's got 64%, 65%. This guy's terrible at picking spots. He, he's only been successful one time in three. With, with 17 tournaments, it's probably some number like that, two and six, one and three. So you want to go deeper than that? I thought you did. We've got the hero versus villain report. And what this does is each row, sh again, shows one player, but it specifically targets the hands where you both put money in. So these are hands you won money from him or he won money from you. It breaks down by different sizes. So you can see if you won lots of big hands or small hands. So like we lost three, three reasonable size pots to this guy. We don't have any big losses which is nice in this report. Um, we don't have any big wins either. We took a, we took a pretty good, three pretty good sized pots from him. So if you highlight one of these reports, you're going to get the hands you were involved with this person in the bottom. So if one of your friends has been playing in these tournaments and saying he's been beating up on you, you can go look in Poker Tracker at the exact hands you've played together and tell him you're full of it. Because here are our hands, and I can see that you did not beat me up Look, you, you, you three bet me once, and I had four two. I'm clearly not calling your three bet. That has nothing to do with you. So I'm sure you want to go even deeper than that, right? On the sidebar, we also have this player box. And you can choose a new player, and you can choose any of your opponents. And you, when you load them in here, 
what you're going to look at now is all of the data and all of the reports of Poker Tracker, everything we've been talking about, you will be looking at from his perspective. So you are looking at it through all of the data through his eyes. And the only thing you need to really keep in mind when looking at data through another player's eyes is that you only get whole card data when he reaches showdown. If he doesn't reach showdown, you don't know what his whole cards are because the hand's not going to tell you. But anything else, and it's for all hands that reach showdown, you have full information, you have the, all, of our, all of our reports, all of our stats, all of the filters, and if that is not enough for you, I don't know what will be. So let's look at an example. We're going to look at one example analysis, and hopefully that will show you how all of this stuff works together. Let's say um, there's one situation that was really bugging us. We've been playing in these tournaments that are called 50-50s. Uh, and the way these work is that they pay out the top five places. Ten people start, five people get paid. Once it gets down to five players, uh, everyone gets their buy-in back. So if you've bought in for ten bucks, once you get in the top five, you definitely get your ten dollars back. And everybody who's in the top five has some amount of chips left. So it takes the other half of the prize pool and gives it out to all the players based on how many chips they have. So that is a, that, that's how a 50-50 tournament works. Um, and we want to look at times we're in the big blind, because we've been playing a lot of these. At times we were six-handed, so we're on the bubble. Once one more player goes out, the tournament is over. That is the end of the tournament. And we want to look at times we have king-queen offsuit, because that hand's been bugging us. We don't need any other reason, but we have, an, we have a real situation here. So you go into the sidebar, you pick your 50-50 flag. That will limit it to 50-50 tournaments. You go into hand details, number of players, Players dealt into hands, six to six. So now we're looking at six-handed play in 50-50 tournaments. Actions and opportunities, pre-flop, post big blind, bang. Add that to filter. Now we're looking at big blind play in a 50-50 tournament, six-handed. Hand values, we go just turn on king-queen. That's king-queen offsuit there. King-queen suit is on the other side. And we go into actions, opportunities, pre-flop, and turn on opportunities, and turn on faced all in. We add those, we have all of our filters right here. And so now we have picked out our situation entirely. And we can look at our spot. We have two hands in our database that match that. It may have felt like you had a lot of data, but sometimes when you go and you look at it, it turns out you don't have as much as you thought. And that's okay. We're still going to look at one of those hands. Let's, we, we've got two hands here. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the second one. We're going to replay it. So we're going to see it in the Poker Tracker replayer. So here is our spot. And let's take a moment to, to look at it. We're in the big blind, just like we said. We have king and a queen. Fold, 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 and this guy pushes all in. So we're facing our all in uh, from him. So our chip stack is 1,955. His chip stack was 725. Our blinds were 60 and 120, uh, and there was a 15-chip uh, ante. So we have 90 chips. These were from the antes here. So we have, to, we have to choose if we want to call his 605 chip bet or we want to fold to it with king-queen here in this spot. So I want you to take a second and think about whether you would call here or whether you would fold. Remember, if you call and you bust him, the tournament is over. You definitely win money because uh, he's out. You're in the top five, and you get one money based on your chip stack plus your buy-in. If you fold here, uh, he now picks up 100 and, uh, 210 chips. Uh, he now has 935 chips. He's still the short stack, and we're going to keep playing. You have a king and a queen. I want you to just take a second and think about our situation. OK. The first thing you should be thinking about, and I hope you were thinking about right now, is what hands would he be playing to make this all in raise with? Does he, he, obviously, he could have aces. He, obviously, he could have kings. What other hands? How far down is he going to go when he makes this all in range? And before we can make any adjustments based on stats, we have to have a baseline. Because if we think the baseline player is playing all in with any two cards here, it's going to radically change how we adjust based on his stats. Because if he's tighter than average, tighter than average of 100% is going to be very different than tighter than average of 10%. So think about what you think an unknown player would play. Start to build this model in your head. This is, what, this is what all the big name pros will do. They, they are able to have a baseline model and then adjust based on individual uh, characteristics. So think about that. Think about what kinds of hands he would play. Now let's add some stats. Now we're going to re start refining our, our model on this player. We've got a baseline idea in our head of what kinds of hands he's going to play. Now let's look. We have 73 hands of data. His VPIP is 11. 
So in the 73 hands that this guy has been playing, so it's probably about two tournaments worth, uh, given, given the length of these tournaments. In two tournaments worth, he has put money in 11% of the time. One hand in nine, this guy's playing. That's it. Preflop raise, 1%. And I can tell you, because I did double check this, that means of his 73 hands, he raised pre-flop before this exactly and only one time. That's it. Only once ever. In both tournaments we've seen him play, he's, he's only ever raised once before. I hope that that changes what hands you think this guy is going to play, at least a little bit. Now, we can look a little bit deeper in his stats and try to see if there's any information there. Let's look at his small blind statistics. This is, this is the, the, uh, the tools pop up here. Um, we're just looking at the top half. There's some stuff bottom, in the bottom, but it's all post-flop stuff, so it's not relevant right now. So let's just look at small blind here. Uh, his VPIP from the small blind is 13%. So one time out of eight, he put money in from the small blind. He has never raised from the small blind, ever, ever, not once. Um, he, so he did no raises of any kind. Uh, he seems to call across all positions. So here are his calling. These are from the preflop section. You can see he kind of calls from everywhere. He's called four out of 25 hands. He's called cold twice, which means you call without having put money in the pot. So you can't, you can't call cold from the blinds. That's why these are going to be zeros. He uh, limps behind limpers one out of seven. So he's not attacking people who, who just call the big blind. He's not attacking people who are acting weak. Uh, he is folding to a blind steal twice. So he's not, when he's in a blind, he's perfectly happy to give his blinds up. Uh, a blind steal is when you're in a blind and someone in the cutoff or the button, the last two positions who haven't put blind money in, they make a raise. So when you're facing a raise from them, it's called facing a steal. Uh, he's done that twice and he folded both times. So you can start to, to kind of piece all of this together and get an idea. But this simple, the sample is not huge. So think about what hands this specific player is likely to raise all in with. Now that we have all of this information, Remember, his tournament life is on the line. If he, if he is called and he loses, he's out of the tournament. He wins absolutely nothing. But he's the short stack. He has an M of about 2.7. So uh, he, could go about, he could go less than three orbits before he is completely out of chips just by folding. So he has to make a move at some point. He has to pick a hand and make a stand soon. So the fact that his tournament life is on the line is going to make him tighter because he doesn't want to lose the tournament. The fact that he is so short with such a short M is going to make him looser. So these kind of are in conflict with one another. And as you play more tournaments, you're going to find out how, how they pull. Do you think this guy is going to play low pocket pairs? Do you think he's going to pick deuces here and happy to play a coin flip for his tournament life? I see one, player, one person shaking his head. What about weak aces? Do you think ace four off suit is OK? Do you think he's? He's willing to take his tournament life into his hands with, with just a, a really weak ace. What about king-queen? Could we have the same hand here? Would he make this shove with my hand? Uh, king-10, could we have him completely dominated? So uh, that's another poker term. Uh, if you have uh, the same card and your other card is better than theirs, it's called dominating. You have a, like, uh, your 70 to 30 favorite uh, in that spot, something like that. Uh, Queen-jack, same kind of situation. If, he, if he's willing to do it with these hands, then we're in a really great spot, right? But if he's willing, if he's, we have to decide what this player uh, is, would open raise with. So now we're starting to build that model. Remember, his VPIP is 11%. So let's start. Oh, first, if you want to convert percentages to actual hands, the equity calculator in Poker Tracker will help you with this. Um, because it's kind of hard to know what 11% of hands is. You know, if, especially if you, if you don't have experience with it, you're like, ah, I don't know. So you can come into the equity calculator, and you can pop that open, and you can choose hand range selector. And then you can use the slider, and you can see what the model says. Um, again, we're still in Sklansky Carlson. You, could, you can play between the models. Um, so this, this is 15%. So think about the hands that you've just decided this guy's willing to go all in with. And here's, here's a 15% range, according to Sklansky Carlson. Wider, looser. So this, this, this guy has got down to ace four suited, down to king's ten suited, pairs down to threes, not twos, and down to ace eight. That's 15% of all hands. Well, we've said he'll play 11% of hands uh, overall, over 73 hands. So let's start by saying any hand in the top 11%, he'll play those. 
It's not going to be perfect. Our sample's not fantastic. We know this, but we're, we're trying to get an idea for what's right to do here in this spot. So this is the top 11%. You don't have the bottom two pairs. You don't have any weak aces at all. Even ace nine is considered a, a middling ace, so that's not too bad. Um, he has no weak suited aces. Uh, that's that's a that's a 11% range. That's a pretty strong range. So Poker Tracker also has a built-in calculator uh, that does ICM. Now ICM stands for the Independent Chip Model. Um, this this uh, has been out there for a little while, and what the ICM does is it takes tournament chips and converts them to real-world dollars, because tournament chips and real-world dollars don't have a have a um, one-to-one -one correlation. Because your last I'm tournament chip is worth a lot yeah, more than your thousandth tournament chip if you have a thousand chip stack. Yeah, because yeah, once you're out, you can win nothing. But that extra chip doesn't mean quite as much. Um, so this model takes your equity, in the, your, your total chip stack, and gives you a result as an equity in the prize pool. It says, with this chip stack, you know, if everything were even, setter is parabus, nothing else to be considered, this is what your equity in the prize pool should be according to me. Uh, and we, this, this has been there in the replay the entire time. I don't know if you noticed it, but if you click it, uh, it will show you the results in this spot. So we're going to be looking at the times we face this all in, and we will see with the average model says whether we should push or fold in this spot uh, with this hand. So, uh, who thinks we should call his all-in raise if he was an average player? Everyone else, I presume, says the default model says call. Everyone who raised their hand, you guys win. So you can click the blue results link here, you can see the full IC entry, but the important thing to note right now is you can, you can look and see what your prize pool equity is right here. If you push, you can say you have you would have against the average model 15.83% uh, equity in the uh, If you fold, 15.28%. Now keep in mind, this is just against the average model. Uh, this is not based on anything we've done specifically to analyze this plan. But the good news is, we can change that. And we can see what the model's rating is. So when we click results, we're going to see what the model says the average player would raise all in with in this spot. And the default range is Thirty-three point nine percent. The model says the average player will raise all in with an M of two point seven when folded to in the small blind with about thirty-four percent of hands. Uh, we, we built this model using uh, some, some pretty robust data analysis, but as we've seen, different players play very differently, and this player is most certainly not average, because we put him on somewhere much tighter than 33.9%, and you can see push equity here and fold equity are not that different, we're only talking 0.6% of the prize pool, so if we're playing a $10 tournament, we're talking about the difference between an expected result of 60, 60 cents. It's not huge, but each little edge in poker adds up, one piece right on top of the other. Uh, and making these decisions in the marginal spots is really how you can, you can expand your advantage and play better than your opponent. So let's change that. So you can click right here once you've been looking at the uh, model results and you can change, you can change this range. So this, by the way, is what 33% looks like. So the average player here is shoving as weak as queen eight suited, king two suited, king six off suit, any pair, any ace. That's a lot of hands. These are weak, weak hands. So we change it. We drag the slider down from 33.8 down to 11%. Suddenly, now we're looking at a whole lot tighter range. With the updated range, who thinks it's a call now? Good, I'm glad nobody thinks it's a call, because it is in fact a call. Good, I'm glad thinks it's a call, because it is in fact a call. So, by looking at this player, by doing analysis of his previous play, we were able to turn a close call into a close fold. And so in this spot, when, uh, when he has this range, our push equity is 14 uh, you can actually play, play with this, and you keep changing and updating the range, and you can figure out what break even is. So if he knew what our cards were. If we turned them face up. We can figure out what's the game theory optimal pushing range for him. Right? When we turn our king queen up, if he could play perfect poker, 
He would have pushed a 24% ring. That would be king nine suited, any ace, any pair. If we think he is, he is pushing less than that, it's definitely a fold for us. If he is pushing more than that, it's a call. So we now have established what a break-even range is for us, basing a push from a short stack at the end of a tournament in a tournament type that we play. So next time that we're sitting in the big blind and we face a shove from a short stack, He's in the small blind. We have a better idea what things to look at and how much to skew things based on his range. If you're starting to see 50%, 60%, and you're sitting with King Queen, you're in a great spot to call. Uh, it, assuming you know, you're know you in otherwise similar situation with your chips relative to the rest of the table. Uh, but in this spot, against this guy, it's a full. So of course, in the actual you tournament, you're a call. Because you always make the wrong play the first time. And we get a lovely, wonderful flop. We've got the king, 9-2, so hooray! We hit our pair. This is great. Your heart starts racing. There's the turn. It's an offsuit 7. Fantastic. If he has two diamonds, he doesn't have a flush yet. You know, none of the straights came in. Uh-oh. There's another diamond. So now if he has two diamonds, he could have a flush. One of the hands that was in his range was ace-king. If he has ace-king, he also beats us. So if he has queens, kings, aces, ace-king, or any two diamonds, he wins. Uh, and of course, his actual hand was ace-five offsuit. Now, I, I want to point out that ace-five offsuit was not in our range analysis for him. So our range was actually too tight. So we can, uh, in the future, when we're trying to do this kind of analysis, we can update our range by saying, hey, the last time I did an analysis of a guy that I thought was really tight, when he was super short, he was looser than I thought. You can add those extra few percent in um, when you're updating uh, your ranges later. Uh, so yeah, no worries about ace-king, certainly no flush. He did have one diamond, though. So uh, here are our takeaways. You should think about poker as a series of discrete decisions that you're going to make when you're playing. Uh, you can use Poker Tracker's filter system to target those very specific decisions. Uh, as we've seen, you can filter for anything under the sun you would like. Uh, you can save filters for later. So target those. Pick the spots that bug you. Pick the spots that you're going to remember. You know, next time you have 6-6 six, six, and you're out of position and it's on the flop, and there's a king up there, and you made a raise preflop, and you're not sure whether you should bet or you should check, you can pick that spot and you can look at it. And when you check call, and, and then, it's on, then the turn is another is a queen, you can decide, do I want to check or do I want to bet? You can, you can pick these spots. And then when the river 10 comes, it just sucks to be you. Uh, you can use the available information to build a mental model of your opponents. Look, this is the way people play poker. You try to imagine what's going on in your opponent's head. You try to go, how is this player going to think? How does he make decisions? So that's, that's what I'm calling this mental model. It's all of the heuristics that's going on in his head or her head uh, to, to make a specific decision. Analyze your options based on your mental model. Think about what you can do. Think about how his actions are going to affect your play. Think about how your hand affects it. And when your mental model is proven wrong, like it just was, we did not think that guy had ace-five offsuit, uh, you can adjust your model. And you will get better at poker if you continue to analyze your game one hand at a time. So I hope that that was instructive and that I opened your eyes a little bit to all of the power uh, that Poker Tracker has to offer for you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy.